G'day guys and pretty soon Merry Christmas. New Year is just around the corner and I hope you're going to get out for some diving on the holidays. Welcome to the Noob Spirit Podcast. I am one of your co-hosts Isaac Shrek Daly and today we're going to get into just another interview with a spearfishing legend. Today it's all about Dan Walsh. He is definitely a veteran. He's one of the OG bottom scratchers. He's still a member, apparently. And uh, he he does a lot of stuff with diving and TV. He's been involved with ESPN diving shows, PBS, Shark Week. Uh, he's been uh, three on a three-man undersea explorer's sub. And uh, he's a real character. I love uh, this gun he sticks with. He's got a JBL sawed-off Magnum. And it's his, still his favorite gun. He had a lot to do with uh, Jack Prodonovich back in the day. And uh, he had Terry Mars on his boat when he landed a world record um, 399.4 pound uh, big bluefin tuna. And um, lots of stories today. Dan's an absolute character. We could have chatted for days. Um, just, a, just, a, just a lovely bloke. And uh, so I hope you enjoy today's podcast. Before we get there, let's hook into a couple of shout outs. Oh, by the way, Patreon is just around the corner. We're going to have it here in 2019 in the new year. So if you love No Spiro and you've been around for a while and you want to support us, we're going to have a few reward tiers on Patreon and look out for that in 2019. Thanks for some positive feedback from some of you guys. Awesome stuff. Righto, let's hook in. Top review. On 99 Tips to Get Better at Spearfishing, available on Amazon. The soft cover is available there. A review by Fox. He said, totally exceeded expectations. I was recommended this book by another Spearow freediver and competitive college level swimmer. What a solid little book packed full of pro Spearow insider knowledge, color photos, and even exclusive, exclusive gear discounts sprinkled in here and there. Fun page turner that made me feel like a little kid absorbing every word and photo. Kind of stupid not to buy it. Helped me learn a lot of information, a lot of important information that otherwise would have taken me years of dangerously diving blind to acquire. Basically, it's like a Spearow golden nugget of info that adds at least 10 years to your life. I don't even want to dive with you if you haven't read this book. Incredible that these crazy Aussies even took the time and put this thing together for new guys. I'll probably have to buy another just in case. Alligator arms, Andy steals mine. So that's from Fox and Rio. That was an awesome review, man. Thanks for that legend. <laughs> Got a good chuckle out of that. Um, next up, Adam Price from North Shore Underwater Club uh, had a, had an awesome uh, email for me. He said, uh, you guys are shout outs. And, uh, sorry. You guys are champions, and uh, he sent along a photo of the club meetup they had down there, and he's always spruiking the podcast with some of the guys, and uh, they're doing awesome things down there in the North Shore Underwater Club. If you're in the Sydney area, that you're spoiled for clubs, honestly. Um, the North Shore Underwater Club with Adam and his uh, guys down there is a great option. They've always got good information and uh, welcoming for new guys. Um, they have a very active team in the last Allman competition, as well, so um, yeah, it's a great place if you want to develop your spear and you live down in that New South Wales area. So those guys are spoiled. All right, um, some shout outs for our retailers the 99 tips to get better at spearfishing. These guys have got our hardcover in stock, right? So Adreno, Brisbane, Melbourne, Sydney, Perth, those things are moving like hotcakes out of there. Those guys just, wow, they just pull through them. Another guy's uh, pouring through them in Australia. You've got the Spearfishing Superstore up in Cairns, the dive shop in Port Lincoln. Now, the dive shop in Port Lincoln in South Australia, this little shop is hidden away, and they're a quirky bunch down there in South Australia. If you guys are down there, I'd encourage you to get in and say hello to Leo from the new Spiro. Head into the dive shop in Port Lincoln. Also, Frog Dive in Willoughby. Say hi to Dennis. Tell him we sent you his way. Go in and get yourself a copy. Spear and Fish down under in Newcastle. Got the book Spear West over in Western Australia. Yeah, head into Spear West and see our man Adam. Or even better, nah, maybe not even better, but Jack. Jack is uh, dealing with lots of guys over there at the Spear West HQ over there in Perth. Check those guys out. Uh, also, Extreme Spearfishing, Brookvale in Sydney. Ash has got 99 tips to get better at spearfishing on his counter. If you're looking for a last-minute Christmas gift, head into any of these retailers. If you're in the US, you're a little bit stuck. We've only got two retailers on there so far, so those guys are hopefully moving these across there. The Dive Source in Florida 
have got our book and Oregon Freediving Company, Daniel Semrad and his team up there. So you can you can get our book wherever you like. If you can't get it from a local retailer, get the soft cover on Amazon.com. But anyway, enough of our promoting this book shamelessly. But uh, it's a bloody good book. We put a lot of time into it. You guys know that if you're regular listeners. So thanks for bearing with me. Let's hook in to this interview with Dan Walsh and uh, enjoy. Adreno Spearfishing are today's proud sponsor of the Noob Spiro podcast. They stock a huge range of equipment that you can find in Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne and now Perth. That's right, spearfishing.com.au have got a huge range of gear. I encourage you to get along, use the code Noob Spiro, N-O-O-B-S-P-E-A-R-O and save yourself $20 on every purchase over $200 when you shop online. G'day Noob Spiro community, thanks for joining me today. We are joined by Dan Welsh and uh, tell us a bit about yourself. Dan, where are you located as well? I am located in Carlsbad, California, which is just north of San Diego, probably about, uh, I don't know, half hour north of San Diego, right on the coast. And uh, you've, got a, you've got a long background. How long have you been spearfishing? How long have you been in and around the water? Oh gosh, uh, since I was a kid growing up in Orange County, um, I guess I'm a kid. I'm 67 years old, so it's been a while. Um, <laughs> and my first ex- exposure to it, I guess, is that when my parents used to take us to Huntington Beach to go clam digging, and uh, I had the brainy idea that, well, you know, if there's clams right here where people are, everyone's competing, maybe there's some out of the water. So I'd go thrash around in the surf and try to dive down and dig, you know, of course, which was futile. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and so that was it. And then then uh, in high school, I got, was able to get my driver's license and uh, started going to Laguna Beach, which was south of the town I lived in. And I went to uh, a local drugstore and I bought a frog gig okay. and put it on a pole, put it on a pole and uh, decided I was going to go be a spear fisherman. And that's kind of how it all started. But I think probably several, I think I've heard several of your other guests have said the same thing. They've got a frog gig or a trident or something, and they put some surgical tubing on it and away they went. I've fallen the same thing pretty much all those guys did. Yeah, right. So you grew up kind of in this, this the bottom scratcher kind of location. So did, have you been involved with those guys? I was. Um, I used to bring, uh, when I was teaching scuba uh, full time, I was would bring classes out on the bottom scratcher and ultimately wound up uh, working on the boat and and ultimately running it for a few years. Oh, wow. um, and uh, yeah, I got my captain's license in 1976. And, and the first boat that I ran is a boat called the Spirit of Adventure, which is here in San Diego. It's now a long range uh, fishing boat, but it's originally, uh, hell, I helped build it. It started out as a dive boat, wow. a 90 foot dive boat. And, uh, but anyway, I came back and that was in Hawaii. We ran it in California for a while, uh, got into a hurricane in La Paz, did some damage to it. We were lucky to keep the boat afloat pretty much oh, wow. got it back to san diego fixed it and then i took it to hawaii and uh, we ran it over there uh, for quite a while and then it came back over here i ran the bottom scratcher uh and in members of the bottom scratchers club used to come out on the boat with their ancient dive gear and these guys were you know when i was in my like, 20s and 30s these guys were probably my age now late 60s early 70s and it's amazing that the stuff they'd wear uh, and the equipment they'd have, I think, uh, I don't know if you can use any of the pictures I sent you or use them for your website or whatever, but yeah. the one of the tuna gun, the one of the tuna gun was my, one of my favorites. That's in my garage right now. I, I haven't rehabbed it yet. Oh, it's oh. still an old, old Wally Potts reel on it and, and all that. And it's, uh, it's uh, seen a lot of service and whacked a lot of fish. I'll, I'll link up some photos in your show notes. So if guys just search Dan Walsh, no spear, they'll come to your show notes page and they can have a look at the spear gun. Is this the Jack Prodonovich gun that you've you, you've sent me? Uh, the, the, the tuna gun is the is a Jack Prodonovich gun. And then the other one is my one of my current guns okay. uh, before, I re- before I rehabbed it. And they're extremely rare. It's uh, you know it's like a strut of various uh, you know, violin or something. You find one, you oh my god! It's, you know, and I saw this thing. It was on Craigslist, 
And I, I mean, I'm about like skid marks out of my driveway to go buy the <laughs> thing, you know. <laughs> and uh, I got it for, I didn't even barter with the guys. I'll give them 300 bucks and uh, went to a local uh, dive store here, James and Joseph, and, uh, and, uh, in San Diego. And we totally re it, new line, new, new, new everything. Ah, and cool. uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's a fun gun. It's perfect for yellowtail. It's a bit. It's a little maybe a little big for that, but it's it's you know mahi mahi stuff like that when we go out uh, you know for floating kelp patties. Mm. It's perfect gun for that. Yeah, it is a feature we see with the older guys. They do tend to get retro with their gear. So what started off with like you sort of chasing clams off the beach, sort of it's culminated in a lifelong sort of adventure in the ocean to captaining boats and um, scuba diving and all sorts of stuff. With that er- with the early spear gun you built. Um, with the surgical tubing and stuff, what were some lessons you learned with the build of that gun? <laughs> well, first what I learned is that the water is cold because I didn't have a wetsuit. <laughs> <laughs> and, and also that um, because the, the, the uh, um, broom handle was only, I don't know, maybe what, four and a half feet long, and, uh, and you had to be real careful to make sure you got that surgical tubing in the back of it because if it came out, it was a big mess and the thing would flare in a different direction than you wanted to go. But, you know, I just had, what I learned mainly was you had to really kind of be comfortable and quiet in the water. You couldn't thrash around and just sort of, you know, as a young kid, 16, 17 years old, that's a little harder to do than it is now. But um, that's the basic stuff back way back then, you know, yeah. boy, just be very comfortable in the water and try to be, uh, well, I don't know, stealthy is the way to put it, but calm, calm and, and you know, my deal is never let the fish know you're looking at them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, they are all good tips. With the spear gun, so you got this broom handle with surgical tubing. Did you have a trigger or a mech to? No, no. It's kind of like a pole spear. Okay. You know, like like you like you you, oh, you see all the ones probably in every store around the the yellow fiberglass oh, yeah. pole spears with the with the sling in the back end. You know, but this was just a homemade one in the '60s. Oh, perfect. And what what sort of fish did you? Did you start shooting? Um, I would go. Actually, I was. I would go at sometimes kelp bass or calico bass um, off Newport Beach and Laguna Beach. But oh. my favorite one was halibut because those are those you know they're on the bottom and and uh, or flounder I guess whatever they're called over there. But anyway, that's that, that was my deal. In fact, it still is. Okay, it still is. That's I, it's, it's my favorite fish to eat. It's my favorite fish to kill. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you're still chasing halibut now. Oh yeah, we've, where I live here in a little location called Terramar, um, there's a you know, there's a halibut hole right out here in front of the house. Oh, perfect. and uh, my dive buddy neighbor George lives across the street from me. <laughs> uh, the biggest biggest one he got was for about 41 pounds, yeah. and I think it was 40 44 inches long and 41 pounds. That's and amazing. mine isn't quite that big. The, you know, the, mine mine's been about 30 inches here. Um, but uh, there's there's a lot of them, and right now they're they're uh, spotting. So uh, unfortunately, because I just had my left knee totally replaced, I am restricted from the water until after the new year. So yeah, okay. I'm miss, I'm missing the season. I'm just living vicariously through my hero, my buddy George. <laughs> <He's>, <laughs> he, 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 I think he's got 32 of them this year so far. Yeah. Oh, wow. Wow. So is that yeah. from, is that from the same location? I mean, because you guys have got this this honey hole, this the same. You know, you're fishing the same location year in year out. Have you noticed yeah. some sort of changes in the numbers or how how prolifically they are in that area? What how does that kind of work? The halibut fishery in that particular little area. Well, well, I've I've noticed um, they tend to be a little bit smaller, but every so often you need a big a big uh, we call it a big barn door, something like four feet, something like that, which is a big one for our our type of halibut, not like the Alaskan ones. Okay, uh, we see those now and then. Um, the, the biggest thing is that um, there's it's really amazing how the sport of spearfishing has uh, really grown tremendously probably in the last 10 years along with uh, hoop netting for lobsters which has just gone out of control crazy the number of people into that now so yeah. we have there's a little more competition out here because it's a public beach yeah but uh, we kind of keep quiet about the, the specific, you know, little halibut hole we got. But if you've got any de- degree of proficiency or you're not blind, uh, you'll find it. <laughs> okay. And how many yeah. how many fish a year can you sort of pull out of this area without 
we'll, you know, to try and keep the numbers sustainable and make sure that there's fish there for the future. Have you got any idea? I would say guesstimating probably between all of us in the neighborhood and everyone else that comes in. Also, they, they, people go and just fish with rod and reel as well. Yep, yep. Um, and I would say there's probably maybe less than 100 a year okay. in, our, in our area. And that's maybe a, 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 a third to a half mile stretch of beach. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, like you said, we don't, we don't, we try not to overdo it. It's also a real popular place to go get bugs, lobster. And, uh, um, you know, I went out on opening day and, uh, oh, I came up with were shorts. So, <laughs> <laughs> which obviously I put it back. I t- actually, I, I was mentoring a, a, a new Spiro guy and showing him, showing him the ropes, if you will. Yeah. And, uh, we've been beaten to the punch. Lobster season opens at, uh, 6 a.m. on the specific Saturday morning. And we got beat to the punch by a bunch of uh, scuba divers, oh, and uh, that, that, that did pretty good haul. But uh, there's still some legals out there, you know. But uh, uh, that day was not my day to get lobster, which <laughs> is, I guess it's okay. I'm allergic to the damn thing, so I always give them away anyway. Ah, uh, yeah, I always find that I don't, I don't really like eating parrotfish, and so I seem to bugger them up every time that I'm hunting them. <laughs> I, th- I think it's just like a subconscious instinct. It's like, well, I'm not going to eat it. So I'm not going to shoot it. Like, and I'm not saying like I'll, I'll shoot one, and one of my friends on the boat will absolutely love it. So, and I'm more than happy to trade them for you know another species, or you know we all share everything out anyway. But I generally don't shoot many of them because I just don't like to eat them. I don't like to fillet them. I don't like to prepare them. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of me. And the other thing I was going to say was like. Um, when you take someone out and you're mentoring them, sometimes actual spearfishing takes uh, the back seat, doesn't it? Because your focus really is getting them proficient. And uh, well, yeah, and, and the fact, I mean, it's it's kind of ingrained in me. I've been a, a now a scuba instructor since 1972. For uh, uh, any of your listeners that you know are now instructors or they <laughs> have a now instructor, my number is number 3132. And they're up into, I think, the 25,000s or something now, oh, wow. or they're more than 50,000. They're huge numbers. So, like, I'm an old geezer with that. <laughs> I've been a Nawi instructor for a long time. So when I go out in the water with, with somebody or when I was running boats and I'd be showing people where to go look for yellowtail or a lobster or an abalone, I kind of my dive instructor deal kind of takes over. So I want to make sure that, you know, they're going to be safe and, 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 and hopefully have fun doing whatever the heck they're going to go do. Yeah, okay. Okay, cool. All right, well, tell us a little bit more about your your, your dive conditions there. So you're 30 minutes north of San Diego. What are you you're diving? A lot of reef structure. Do you get pelagics there? What's the water temps and stuff like that? Well, we get uh, – the water temp right now is a, is a nice uh, – I don't know what it is in Celsius, so sorry, but it's uh, right around 65 degrees. Um, I took, uh, I've got a small, uh, 22 foot Grady white boat that, that my neighbor George and I took out, uh, kelp patty hunting before I had my surgery. And we had water that was 70, uh, was it 78.3 degrees, which is crazy. That's Hawaii temperature water yeah, offshore. Yeah. Uh, but typically like in the winter time, it'll get, uh, uh, high fifties, 58, 57, something like that in the summertime right here at the beach. Um, we don't even wear wetsuits. You know, the water is in the 70s, 75, 74. Visibility runs anywhere, depending on right now it's kind of choppy and overcast. Um, so visibility uh, inshore was maybe 15 feet, and uh, offshore it's just all blown out, so it wasn't all that good. But typically we'll get 40-foot visibility at times. You know, oh. it's not it's not pristine, yeah. but uh, it's, it's, it's enough to see what you're doing. And um, when you've traveled all around the world and like you've dived Australia, Hawaii, you've been, you know, New Mexico, you've dived a lot of different locations. How special is it diving your local area? Is it still your favorite? Well, as it turns out, having run the, uh, the dive boats, uh, San Clemente Island, which is 60 miles offshore from San Diego, um, is uh, I've been out there and logged over 1,500 days. And it is my absolute favorite place in the world to dive. The water is, is clear, it's warm, and in the summertime, don't even wear wetsuits. I've had some, some great experiences spearing fish there. Um, and uh, it's just beautiful. There's the kelp forests. Um, one of my favorite dives is a little site called Little Flower. And it's an August, August night, I'm making a night to dive. I, this was a scuba dive. I just went and sat on the bottom. It was a full moon, and I just sat there for, God, 15 minutes, just 
just watching stuff go by in the moonlight, and it was just spectacular. But it's also, uh, right now, it's where, you, you, if it, your guys, your listeners are uh, in tune to what's been going on here with bluefin tuna and big cow, 200-plus pound tuna, this is where all the Spiros are getting them. It's just off San Clemente Island. Um, I was out there uh, with a radio show host here in town, a guy named Pete Gray from Let's Talk Hookout, and... Uh, uh, he took me out on his boat for some sport fishing, and we hooked into a, a probably 220-pounder that we had for a couple hours and lost it. But uh, you what, see, the, the Spiros have been doing extremely well, uh, some guys getting several for the season, and uh, it's still going on out there. The water temp is probably 60, high 60s, wow. and uh, it's a Navy island, so sometimes the Navy closes it when they're bombing the crap out of Pyramid Cove or some of these places, but uh, when you can get out there, uh, that's still the hot spot, it, although it is kind of slowing down a little bit. So that's my favorite place in the world. I've been all over the place. I've been to Australia a few times and, and all through Micronesia and, and uh, Peru and, and Mexico and Caribbean. And, uh, yeah, I, I really like it here. Like it's, I guess it's what I grew up with. Yeah, yeah, your local's always special. Um, yeah. It's like that going back to New Zealand for me. I mean, um, but Brisbane, like where I am on the east coast of Australia, it's some special diving conditions. But there's just – and, like, you go back to New Zealand, the water's cooler and there's less range of species, but it's still, like, really special experience and uh, I love it so I can completely relate to your story. I was actually chatting with Josh Pedersen from further up the coast in California last week and he was telling me he got to go out for a shot at some of these bluefin. Uh, he, he unfortunately missed out but his mate got I believe a 115 pound one and uh, they were just super stoked so it's a real oh. sounds like a real experience out there. It really is and it's uh, it's unfortunate that you know the, the, my surgery was scheduled for when it was because I'm just dying missing the whole season but you know as I uh, said during the just when we we're getting things rocking and rolling I'm not a, I'm not a trophy guy I'm not you know someone that's you know, I'm no Terry Moss. I just, I'm like the, the blue collar guy. I just go out and I want to, you know, shoot a fish for, for dinner and feed people and have a good time. Um, although that being said, I wouldn't mind having my crack at getting a, you know, a nice big bluefin. You know, anything over about 75, 80 pounds on up would make me happy. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I'm in. You know. I'm coming. Um, all right. Yeah. I was going to ask you a little bit, because you've been captaining boats and stuff as well. How did you make the transition from, I'm guessing, like shore diving, like where you started out, onto boats? Well, um, mainly it was because of uh, the fact that I was teaching. Um, and uh, when I was a kid, my dad I used to take me sport fishing. <laughs> would take me sport fishing. And uh, so I had experience with boats at an earlier age. But then when I got... Um, you know, into the diving mode, the scuba instruction mode, we did two things. We would take people diving uh, on the boat one day and then on the beach another day. Yeah, okay. And the more I dove on the boats, the more I realized this is this is my deal, mm. you know, and this is what I want to do. Uh, ultimately, I said, you know, as a dive instructor, I then got a job as a deckhand on the bottom scratcher for in order to get my seat time to get my captain's license. This was in 1975, 76, okay. and uh, brace yourself for the huge salary I'm about to tell you. I was I was making a full ten dollars a day as a deckhand, <laughs> and that was for two, <laughs> a 24-hour day as well. Oh wow! Up after people's messes and everything else, but I spent a lot. I did that because I needed seat time in order to qualify and get my U.S. Coast Guard captain's license. Yeah. So that's what that that was always. Sometimes you got to give a little to get a little, you know, and that's what I did. And then uh, I'm still licensed. I still do uh, stuff with boats for people now and then. Yeah. And uh, it's just, you know, it's, it's just so much easier. And you, you know, the best part about boat diving, you don't get sand in your boots or your feet. <laughs> you keep the sand off. Keep your sand off everything. You know, you, that's, that's, that's the best part. And your boots last, you know, um, a, a couple of years instead of a couple of months. So uh, yeah, yeah. You know, def some definite advantages. Um, look, if Turbo was here, he'd laugh at me because, um, you know, like I learned a lot of things about boats from doing courses or reading books rather than um, firsthand. Although, you know, I have been out on, I don't know, tens of boats now, maybe somewhere in the order of 20 or 30 boats. Um, but 
I still really don't know a lot about uh, about it. I've never captained a big boat or anything like that. To, can you walk us through kind of learning the ropes as a deckhand and what that experience was like? What were some of the lessons you learned? Well, the first thing you learn is to do what the captain says. <laughs> because, <laughs> because ultimately he is responsible to uh, the passengers and to the Coast Guard and to the boat owner and, and uh, for the, you know, re- as responsible for the safety of the vessel and, and the passengers. So, uh, but the first thing you learn is how to how to tie the boat up and untie it, and uh, that's the, probably the first thing you learn. And then, then uh, uh, <laughs> and that, cleaning the decks, cleaning the toilets. Uh, if somebody gets seasick in a place they shouldn't, clean that up. You learn. It's it's a real basic hands-on kind of deal. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. everyone thinks, oh, you're gonna you're the boat captain. It's real luxury. No, it's it's really a lot of work. And, yeah. and I still to this day. Uh, I typically only sleep about four hours at a time because uh, my whole life was, you know, on a watch, a wheel watch, or or having my what's called a second ticket, which is the other operator, uh, another captain on board. If you're going to be out over 12 hours, it's Coast Guard requirement. But taking turns, you know, so I'm a, I'm a four hour sleeper, yeah, and right. still am. Wow. And uh, but it, you just the, you learn to deal with people, and there's good people, there's bad people, like the guy that threw my spear gun over one time. Uh, overboard because he was pissed off at me and uh, you know but you, you remember all the good people and you try not to worry about the ones that are real jerks <laughs> yeah right yeah okay. you actually bring back memories I mean I worked out of a dive operation in Tonga for a while when I did my scuba diving instructors and um, I remember just how much work was involved between you know testing tanks filling tanks cleaning dive gear washing you know servicing regulators it was a hell of a lot of work and then you add that to a boat and then a boat's got all its other joys as well. There's a, there's a hell of a lot of work to do when you're taking people out on boats. So um, definitely, if, well, if, not only that's good to say, not only that, but the, the, and assisting people getting their gear on and everything. If you, I, I did not send along any pictures of what my feet look like because my feet have had so many weight belts dropped on them, and oh. my and uh, my toes broken so many times that my big toes, my nails look like Fritos. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> That is rough. It is, it is rough. <laughs> yeah. and, and teaching those entry-level scuba diving courses is a real um, exercise in patience sometimes and, um, and grace, I think. You've got to be really uh, gentle with people that are just learning. It's often their first experience and you want it to be good, but it's frustrating too because they just don't know really basic things. So, yeah. No, but you know, the first thing, the, the, one of the first things I learned as a scuba instructor way back when is to separate any... Um, any relationships, boyfriend, girlfriend, brother, sister, husband, wife, anywhere there was a relationship in my dive groups within the pool and everything, I separated them because typically one, sometimes the guy, sometimes the girl or whomever uh, is a know-it-all. And so you're trying to teach them how to clear a mask or do whatever. And they take over and start, they get mad because their, their, their mate isn't uh, getting it right or whatever. So that was the, one of the first things I learned about people and instruction is separate friends or family. Yeah, okay, so you run it sort of more like a kind of a military-style thing. Where it's yeah, just, I guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, I mean, we're talking about boating and spearing here, but did you have any sort of mentors along the way? I did, and fortunately, probably some of the best ones in the world, and they were like several members of the Bottom Scratchers Dive Club that used to come out, and, and then one of the other fellow boat captains, a guy named Bob Trask, but Jack Pradonovich is uh, the guy that makes the Pradonovich, well, he's passed away now, but he made all these Pradonovich guns, which are really highly sought after guns. And uh, um, and his, his best buddy was Wally Potts, and Wally kind of made reels. And these guys would come out on the boats, and uh, and you just watch these guys do their thing, and the, the dive gear they would use. Uh, Bill Johnston, the boat owner, when he would clear his mask, he'd take a camel cigarette and smear it, smash it all on the inside of his mask, and then rub it all out, and that's how he cleared his mask. <laughs> Jack Pradonovich wore a wore a vest that, if you know what a Chinese abacus looks like, yeah. that's what Jack's dive vest looked like. <laughs> and Wally was just so damn big, you know, that he hardly could fit into a wetsuit. And these guys, I mean, they looked like you know the ragtag bunch of guys, but boy, they hit the water. And I've dived with them before. And they just, you know, I was, you know, young buck in my 20s and 30s. These guys leave me in my dust, yeah, yeah. you know, in the dust. I mean, they just were so stealthy and so good at it. And you just sort of, sort of just to watch what they do. I yeah. mean, that's what I did. I, I talked to them and watched what they do. And, and, and you know, I, 
ask Jack, you know, it's, it's about it several times and how you do this, how you do that and rigging and stuff like that. He uh, uh, actually only had one eye. His, 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 when he made spear guns and chefs, he would, pra- you know, work on them in his yard and, and uh, perfect them. And he lost an eye when he was doing testing on one of the guns. He had such a perfect shot on uh, it was he was testing. He shot the spear and it literally came right back, perfectly right back at him. And it hit him in the eye and he lost an eye years and years and years and years ago. Oh, um, wow. The flip side of that is that the, be- the best thing I remember about Jack is that Jack is always told, said, Dan, Remember why you're doing this. You're doing this because you want to have fun. Don't forget that. This is fun. Don't ever forget that. Yeah, no. Nice. That's, that's kind of where I'm at. I know I've, I think I've heard some of your other guys say the same thing, but it's true. Yeah. That's what it's all about. Yeah. You know, yeah. like I said earlier, I'm not out to prove anything. I'm no, you know, I'm no Terry Boss or any of these other big world class guys. I'm just a guy with a spear gun that wants to go get something to eat. I think at the end of the day, where you should all be united in that part of it, you know, just to get the the stoke factor of spearfishing and uh, completely relate. And um, if you keep your focus on that, you don't get ego doesn't get in the way either. So it's good advice, man. Um, I guess while you're talking, I was sort of thinking about when you're heading out spearing with some experienced guys, and you start tagging along, following them. I tend to have a, the attention span of about five minutes, and even if they're awesome to watch, I watch them. And then sometimes I struggle to, you know, observe some tactics that I can adopt myself. And um, did you sort of observe anything specific from any of these guys and, and, and apply it to your own diving? Well, first off, when I would go out, out in, to watch these guys, I would not have a gun with me. I would just go follow them around so I could watch. And, if, you know, you got to try to focus. The thing that, that was just how smooth they were. You know, and these guys have been doing it since the 30s, and it's now, it's now the, you know, the early 70s that I'm exposed to these guys, and they had their chops down. I mean, they could, their, their, their dives to get a, you know, dive down and do their drops were, were flawless. And uh, it was just, everything was just so natural to them. And they also knew what they were targeting. And that's something else that I've learned is know your species, you know, know what it is, you, what you're, you know, know what. The, the, their habitat, know how they act, like whether it's a white sea bass, an elusive white sea bass, or a calico bass in the kelp, or a halibut, or whatever, you know. Um, they really, that's, those are the things I learned from those guys. Is know, know your species, and just try to be as fluid, literally, and, and in the water as, as possible. Yeah, cool. All right. What was um, one of the biggest obstacles you had starting out, and how did you sort of approach it? Well, <laughs> when I was first, when I was younger, I, you know, I didn't barely had a driver's license, and uh, so I couldn't afford a wetsuit. I couldn't afford a, a spear gun or anything else. So the biggest obstacle was um, uh, just being poorly equipped. You know, I had uh, probably I think I had some old Swimmaster duck feet fins, <laughs> and uh, and uh, a, you know a, a mask. Of course, no, mine did not have a snorkel with the ping pong ball in it, but. Just a real super basic mask, probably I bought at the drugstore. Okay. And it just, you know, there just wasn't, I just wasn't in tune to, there just wasn't anything as organized then as there is now. I mean, my God, the, the stuff that I learned when I took a free diving course a few years ago, and uh, I think about the stuff I learned in that course. I've been a diving instructor for 40 something years. I took a stuff free diving course a couple years ago, and I thought, God, how did I not kill myself when I was younger? <laughs> Yeah, you know, yeah, hyperventilating and everything else, you know. Yeah. This is a super common thing we, we hear about. Who did you do your course with? Uh, Mark uh, Mark Lozano, uh, an FII course. Yeah, and nice. uh, I had a good time, you know. I, but, but the flip side, I also just, um, I don't know, several months ago, uh, I took a course in Frenzel equalizing with Ted Hardy, who yep, I just yep. saw at the DEMA show. And, and I had a, turns out I had a, you, uh, dysfunctional left eustachian tube. I okay. went and had surgery on it um, in April, and uh, between the surgery to fix my eustachian tube and Ted's uh, excellent instruction, um, Frenzel is just, you know what? It's so easy that you know, I felt like such an idiot when I finally figured it out or when Ted helped me figure it out. I went, oh my God, this yeah. is so easy. What took me so, why, what was the mental block I couldn't figure it out? 
He's a, he's a talented yeah. dude, and he's just a nice, down to earth guy, old Ted. He's got some online courses actually. He's trained hundreds of people to use that um, the Frenzel technique. How how much of a difference has it made to you to your freediving? Uh, it makes a lot of difference because it's um, it's just so much easier, and I can go deeper, faster. Um, before I would get to you know 15, 20 feet, and that would be about it. And now that's not an issue. Um, and so I'm really, really happy about that. In fact, I did a, if, if anyone has been to his, his website, I did a video testimonial um, uh, talking about my experience taking the course. And, uh, you know, I, I, you know I'm, I mean, I'm no agent for him. I mean, I'm just, a, I'm just grateful that uh, I was able to find him and, and uh, get the course and figure out the, you know, have him help me figure out how to best do that. It's that if you're going to go anything deeper than probably 25 feet or so, you definitely don't want to be doing, you know, Valsalva. You want to be yeah. doing Frenzel. Yeah, 100%. No, great advice, and yeah, people can go and check that out at immersionfreediving.com. Um, definitely recommend Ted Hardy. He's um, been on the show before, great guy. Um, I, I want to come and catch up with all of those guys at DEMA one year too. Maybe next year's our year. So, all right, what, what's uh, maybe what's one of the best days out you've ever had? Best days out. The best day? Well, the, one of the best days was uh, out at um, uh, one of the offshore islands in Baja, and uh, I, I was – you know, the I mentioned earlier the elusive white sea bass, and I was at a place uh, at Benitas Island, and um, actually I was out looking for more of just a, like a big lunker calico bass, and here's this white sea bass that presented itself, oh, wow. and uh, I had to take it, so I got it, I nailed, got a great shot on it, got it. Of course, they they immediately dive. Uh, for the bottom and try to tangle themselves and their spear line as much as they can in kelp. But uh, you have to be persistent and make a lot of drops and have your knife and cutting things loose. And finally, I got them and got them back to the boat. So that was a, a very happy day for me. Okay, cool. You you gave us a an abbreviated version of that story. I want to get into a few more details if we can. Do, do you remember, were you swimming into current, going with the current? Um, how deep were you? Were you swimming along the surface when you saw the fish? Um, I was. It, it, it was I was, uh, it was in a kelp, uh, a fairly thick kelp forest um, on the east side of uh, Benitas, East Benitas Island. We all, all the places we had names for and uh, this this dive site we call Shannon Saddle, and it's, I don't know we called it that. The, the cook on the boat's name was Shannon, so we figured we'd name it after her. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, um, anyway, so I'm swimming along, and like I said, they, you see these big calico bass, and the big ones they're, they're really wide and thick, fat faces, and they're kind of gold. And it's one of my favorite you know, eating fish as well. And I was, I just went to go whack one of those, and here's this big white sea bass or I don't know 45 pounds of my recollection and it was big it was like several feet long and uh and I was I just dropped down and just hung there for a minute and watched him I just was watching him for a while and he's just swimming around just oblivious to me and like I said before I, I try not to make eye contact with fish yeah. so if he comes one way I try to go the other way and play a little game of cat and mouse finally I had what I thought was a good shot on and I took it so it was kind of fun you know um it was, uh, you know, uh, and I was using, I was not using a, a very large gun. Um, I was using. Sounds like you got a, you, we, sounds like you got a train robbery going on in the background. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, we've got a, we've got a local, it's a couple hundred yards away. That's some guy that likes to honk the horn a lot. Um, <laughs> I didn't, didn't even know you'd pick that up. Anyway, I was using uh, what your, your listeners would, uh, those that are familiar with JBL guns would uh, know as a sawed off Magnum. Um, they originally were made by AMF Swim Master, and uh, it's and called a Ford uh, a sawed off Magnum. The uh, swim, white Swim Master called it a Ford Ford G44, and uh, JBL calls it a Ford D44. Okay. So if you want to look up on JBL a Ford D44, it's not that big of a gun, and I whacked a pretty big fish with it, and yeah. uh, was pretty lucky. Okay, that sounds <laughs> yeah. awesome. Yeah. Um, all right. So, I mean, white white sea bass um, are, an, are are a species that I've heard a lot about, and it's something that I'm intrigued to try and hunt one day. Um, there's an Aussie guy that's gone over there. He lives in LA. Uh, Tank said he's he's taken a few of them, and they just they just sound like an awesome awesome species to hunt. The grey ghost, I think you call them. They are. They are. And we actually, we have them off the beach here. And uh, I've not got one, but I saw a spiro guy that did. 
and it was probably a 40 pounder wow. and uh, uh it's pretty nice you, they, they also they make kind of like a, a, a clicking croaking kind of sound and uh and for some reason, I have no idea why, and, and I used to produce a, a fishing show, a sport fishing show, and the guys would call these white sea bass, they call them biscuits. Okay. And I have no idea why, and everyone that I would ask would say, I would ask, why do you call them biscuit? And I could never get an answer from anybody. I'd always like to know, why the hell do they call these things biscuits? But uh, we have them off the beach here certain times of the year. Yeah, right. And, uh, yeah, just, uh, that's what it's, it's, it's actually, frankly, it's, it's easier to, go off a boat into a kelp bed, you know, and uh, play around there and, and, uh, can, you know, kill, kill, get, try to get one there. Guys, head over to vimeo.com. Check out the How to Spearfish video series by Luke Potts. There's nearly four hours of video training there, and they're divided into five different videos so far to help you take on the areas of difficulty that you might have. Now, there's a beginner's guide to spearfishing gear. There's a guide to how to increase your breath hold for spearfishing. There's techniques for spearfishing yellowtail kingfish, which also doubles as a guide to hunting pelagic fish. There's a, a guide techniques for spearfishing snapper which is a really good um, helpful guide for approaching canny reef fish which is a tough one and finally a guide to spearfishing around sharks if you want to buy any of these videos use the code noob spiro and save a bit of cash check it out vimeo on demand how to spearfish when you go to buy a shirt you're probably like me you are happy to look like a 90s dad now sadly that will not take you forward in life. <laughs> but I've got good news for you. Today you can go to noobspiro.com, support the Noob Spiro podcast, and get yourself a great shirt that will make a difference. Perhaps you won't look like a 90s dad anymore, as Turbo accuses me of every other week. If you pick up three girlfriends the first day you own your Noob Spiro shirt, it's probably a coincidence, but they are a bloody good shirt. Head along to NoobSpiro.com, go to the shop, grab a Noob Spiro shirt. Shirts for Spiros, buy Spiros, for Spiros, about Spiros, everything Spiros. NoobSpiro.com. All right, so as, um, I want to get into maybe your favorite species to hunt and how you how you sort of hunt them successfully. My favorite thing is it would be the halibut. It's my favorite fish because... Uh, um, I've been around them for so long, and uh, uh, I, boy, they really get mad when you shoot them. I, I've never seen a fish get so pissed off as a halibut. <laughs> they really do not like the, they don't like the activity at all. No. But um, I, I uh, again, um, I'll swim by them, just sort of look out of the corner of my eye, kind of, kind of take a look and see what they're doing. We've got right out in front of the house here. We've got a big sand flat, and then we've got structure right next to it. Everyone thinks that halibut are always in sand flats. They're not. They're usually, they may be near sand flat or like we've got uh, structure and reef with some sand flats, you know, within all, uh, you know, within the reef area. Uh, and yeah, that's yeah. where you, that's where you go look for them. Okay. And uh, same thing at San Clemente Island uh, out there. There's a place, in fact, one of the, one of the biggest ones that I ever got there was right next to a sandy area. And uh, I, I try to, I don't get right on top of them, but, you know, slide at an angle. I try to get sort of next to them a little bit at an angle, and I try to whack them right in the head, you know, but sometimes you don't get quite that shot that you want, and then uh, that's when that's when all hell breaks loose and you really have a you have a fight on your hands. Yeah, okay. All right, so they're a, they're a bottom feeder like a, like a flounder or we have a flathead here in Australia. Are they like an, yes. a, an ambush feeder? Do they ambush? Yeah, they, they are. They are, and... Uh, and same thing, even like the guys that fish for them with rod and reel off the beach here, they'll throw a lure called a crocodile, you know, or a, a, you know, so a plastic or something. Ah, okay. And they just, and it's, it's the same thing. They'll be dragging, and even I've done it before, just dragging along the bottom, just kind of slow, and all of a sudden, wham, you get whacked. And uh, you, like you said, I mean, you put it perfectly. It's an ambush. Yeah. It's okay. exactly what it is. All right. So, I mean, half the battle with a lot of these species is, is just sort of finding them because um, often they camouflage in really well to the reef or sand or whatever it is, structure that they're, they've decided to bed down in. Um, how do you spot these fish? What's the, what's your, have you got the outline fixed in your eyes or what do you do? Well, the first thing is that their eyes are on top 
they're, they're not like you know like a typical fish on either side. So as they as they mature, their their eyes are are on top of the of the of the of their surface, and they're they try to match the color of the bottom. Um, sometimes they do a pretty good job of it. Sometimes they don't. And the first thing you look for um, when you first start looking around are the beds where they were. And they're pretty easy to, you'll see them. Once you see one, it's kind of like an abalone. Once you find your first one, you'll see them all over the place. Uh, same thing with the same thing with the halibut. They, um, uh, you'll, you'll find beds of sand where they were lying. And then you know, okay, I'm in the right area. And then sometimes you find them, some, they're, they're buried or semi-buried. And sometimes they're just laying there uh, thinking that they're camoed and they're, and they're not. <laughs> so you just, you just really have to pay attention, you know, and look, you know, just kind of look. But like I said, once you see, you know, once you see your first one, uh, it gets easier and easier to spot them as you go along. And like I said, it's my favorite thing. It's what I started out doing, you know, when I was a kid. And so uh, it's, yeah. you know, and that's how I like doing it. And the bloody good eating too, I bet you. Yeah. Oh, my God, that's my favorite. Yeah, it's my yeah. absolute favorite, as long as you don't overcook them. All of those bottom, those ambush-type fish, they all seem to taste bloody good. Um, so you said don't dive bomb them from directly overhead. Approach them at an angle. Now, do you prefer to approach them from the back end, like from their tail or from the side, or what's your sort of approach there? I, I personally, I like to get them a little bit from behind in the side, uh, there's other guys will tell you, oh, I like to get them from the front, and so and that, I mean, everyone has their own own way. My way that's always worked for me is I like, and I don't know, maybe I just come up on on the left side of them and just kind of behind and and over them a bit, not straight over them, but over them, and then uh, I'm, I'm shooting down. It yeah. does two things. It it uh, uh, depending on what spear tip you're using, uh, or a flapper or a breakaway or whatever, um, it uh, you've got a real good chance of pinning it into the bottom. Yeah, you know, and that's and that's very helpful. And like I said, they 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 are not very happy when you've when you've shot them. So yeah. <laughs> uh, you've got to you've got to dispatch them as quickly as possible. I seen a couple of guys shooting them over in Norway the other day. They're huge friggin' ones. They're 130 kilos. It was 280 pounds. This one they shot, but uh, it, went, it went berserker. They had to put two two shots in it. But I was going to say, part of the problem with. Um, shooting species on the bottom is um, if you're using a standard flopper your spear will penetrate but the flopper won't engage because the shafts actually hit the rock behind the fish so it hasn't the shaft hasn't been able to go through the fish enough for the flopper to open is that something yeah. you've experienced with these in, the, in my early days yeah <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> until i figured out this isn't uh, the best thing to do yeah you know you can you can get away with it if you're uh if it's on a total, if it's totally in the sand, yeah, you can probably get away with it. But otherwise, no, you better have you know a breakaway, a slip, whatever you know, call it whatever you want, just something other than a flopper. Probably you know? just just like what your approach as well, shooting the fish on an angle is allowing that shaft to travel through a bit more. And if it does hit the bottom, it's still got that forwards momentum, so the flopper can open. So yep. that's pretty cool. Yeah. All right. Yeah, but I don't. But but I haven't. I haven't. Uh, you know, I think I've got a couple spear guns that have. I got little ones, little. Little teeny spear guns from when I used to work for the company. We made spear guns. I got a couple of those, but but uh, with those type of tips. But for the most part, I've got a, a breakaway tip. You know, I think that if we used to call them, I think they're called slip tips, whatever. You know, whatever the current name that they're all called. That's you know, that's what I use. Yeah, nice, nice, <laughs> nice, cool. Well, some great tips there for chasing halibut. So I hope people got a ton out of that. Um, look, toughest situation. What's the toughest situation you've been in the ocean? Uh, whether it's boating, spearing, scuba diving, what did you, what 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 happened, and, and what what did you learn from it? Well, um, turns out it was in your neck of the woods, off a place called Dangerous Reef, and I don't know how far that is from where you are, but uh, sounds I aptly was there. named already. <laughs> no kidding, I'll tell you. <laughs> um, diving, I oh, was over there with uh, my filmmaker friend Marty Snyderman, and we were shooting a Shark Week show. And so we were on the Faley uh, for several days doing the white shark stuff in the cages and, and, and all that. But then it was time to go and show for the television show where the, uh, what the sharks fed on, which the pinnipeds, the sea lions. So we go, to danger, we go to Dangerous Reef and we're in a little skiff. And I've got a big broadcast camera and uh, the beta cam, the thing's three feet long. And 
I'm I'm on the bottom, and we're shooting the pinnipeds at play. And oh, look at this! They're frolicking around. Isn't this cute? Look at this! And all of a sudden, it became a ghost town. And I'm looking around, like, oh crap! Where is it? You know? And uh, they didn't leave just because I was there. Because I can <laughs> guarantee you that. So I'm going, oh crap! So now I'm going, all right. So I I look and I can see off in the distance. Well, there is the, the surface. There is the skiff. So. Maybe what I better do is kind of work my way towards there in case I need to make a quick departure. And uh, as it turns out, the closer I got to the skiff, the better I thought it was good to make a quick departure before you know I became one of the playful pinniped victims. <laughs> and uh, I, I did like a Polaris missile with this big giant beta cam straight for the surface, exhaling as I went all the way, by the way, as yeah, yeah, a scuba yeah. instructor. Yeah. <laughs> and I broke the surface like a like a trident, you know, sub coming out of the water, beta cam flying into the into the skiff with me hanging on to it being dragged right in over it. And uh, that was probably the toughest I mean the toughest thing. But uh, the other the other thing that would be similar would be as far as dealing with, you know, sharks and that was on this on the trip where uh, Terry Mosh got his big uh, world record bluefin tuna. Uh, down at Guadalupe Island, uh, it's way more sharky now than it was even then. But it's the, about the only place that I ever was kind of always looking behind me and down below me to see if there's anything coming after me, you know. And uh, that's those those are probably the ones for me. Other, other than that, I've had a pretty, I don't know, a pretty uh, safe, calm existence. Yeah, no, nice. I mean, sometimes with the toughest situation, um there's things you can take away from the situation and kind of learn from it. But I think you kind of did everything right. You you were on scuba, so you stuck to the bottom, made your way back to the boat, and um, and then ejected quickly. So that sounds like a, a pretty good way to deal with the situation, really, because if you're on the surface, you're probably looking more like a seal or, or some sort of prey. So yeah. it sounds, like, sounds yeah. like a smart move. And I've been in the water with, with a bunch of hammerheads on Cocos Island and, and uh, blue sharks off the coast here and stuff. So, it's you know, it's just, uh, I'll tell you what, actually, it's funny as while we're talking about sharks, the, 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 we, I did a show years and years ago. It was a shark tagging competition for CBS. And uh, out in the blue water, I'll tell you what, to me, the scariest shark is are mako sharks. Yeah. I don't know if they call them Makos somewhere else, but Makos. Those things are crazy. They're crazy. They skittish around. They're, they're, they're just all over the place. Like they're having a nervous breakdown or something. And yeah. they're just crazy fast. And, and they just look to be like you know, they're out of control. But, boy, I'll tell you, uh, the, the great whites and, and the hammerheads, they just kind of swim along, do their thing. You know, um, uh, in fact, we just had a kid uh, opening day of lobster season about three miles down the beach. Uh, got bit by a great white on his shoulder he's fine okay. um okay. and uh you know so we, we've got him around here you know and and when i go uh ab diving uh season closed right now but the past few years i've gone to northern california to ab dive uh we know they're there you know but uh, you know just become part of the food chain but uh, hope hope for the best but you know i don't go out looking for trouble either you know yeah. it's probably the best thing i could say I was going to say with with sharks, there's a guy in New Zealand called Riley Elliott, and he is a shark researcher. He's um, he's got some great videos about diving with makos, and I, I kind of agree with you. They they seem like like uh, some of the bigger sharks seem to have two modes. It's this cruise mode or the attack mode, and um, you can see it in their body language. But sometimes with um, mako sharks, they just seem very unpredictable all the time. And, um, I think they are. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> but thankfully, you don't see them very often, and I, I don't think that they're very well populated either. Um, no, no, you won't see them inshore here. You know, it'd be very, very unusual to see that they're they're open ocean. You know, pelagic. They, you don't see them around here. Uh, I'd be very, su- be very surprised to see one here in, in the beach area, very close. I've never even seen one, uh, even around San Clemente Island or some of the other places. It's usually out in in uh, blue water. Yeah, where, nah. where we, we see those. Yeah, they are a beautiful animal too. I mean, when you watch those, um, you watch the big game fishing boats, and they've got the cameras on board down at the transom, back of the transom, filming towards their teasers, and you see these makos doing like sixty kilometers an hour. Just they, <laughs> that, those things, just they they move. They are amazing. It's very cool. Those are very cool videos. I've seen those as well, and also I've seen the stuff that Riley's done. It's it's yeah, pretty amazing. Yeah, good cool. stuff. And I'll yeah. link up a couple of um, 
bits of information if guys do get a bit are a bit concerned about diving with sharks because um it's a question that comes up time and again. So hey, look, while we're talking about new guys, let's get into our veterans' fault because um. This is normally the part of the show where we sort of go deep into an area, an area of our guests' expertise, and I think we're going to dial in on some advice for new Spiros today, so really sort of keen to hear what you've got to say for guys that are just starting out. Okay. Well, you know, as I've said, and as people know now, I've been a dive instructor for a long time. Um, the biggest thing that I would have to say for a newbie Spiro is try not to rush yourself in the learning process. I mean, my God, I'm 67 years old and I'm still learning stuff. And, and uh, you know, some guys are naturals at it. My neighbor, George, he's, he's a way, way better Spiro than me. Um, you know, and then there's others of us that we just sort of have to learn, you know, and I don't, you know, as a, new, as a newbie, don't go out and buy some big ass tuna gun and going off the beach thinking you're going to have any success with it. You know, just kind of take it easy, you know, start, start a little slower. You know, there's, there's so many different resources out there. Terry Moss's book is a great book the, and, and free diving blue water and it's in tree diving. Yep. Um, the, the, uh, the, 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 I guess probably the first thing I would say is take a free diving course and there become that seems to be a big thing at the, at the Dima diving trade show. I mean, uh, now he's got one, Patty's got one, SSI's got one, uh, FII, PFI. It, God knows, there's tons of them. Take a free diving course. Just do it. Yeah. You will be so so happy that you've done it. You learn so much. I was probably the worst student in the course because I I had such bad habits. You know, snorkel in my mouth and. Hands over my eyes, I was doing everything wrong, you know, and didn't even know it. Love your honesty. Um, yeah, you know, so. I was going to preface that too. I was going to say like, um, completely agree with you, do a free diving course. The one sort of recommendation I would sort of put on that is that guys do a free diving course with a instructor that is familiar with spearfishing because um, there's some unique challenges to spearfishing. And if that's your focus for learning free diving, then you should do a course with an instructor that kind of understands that and and what's involved in, in that sort of process because, um, f- you know, spearfishing uses free diving, but free divers uh, do things slightly differently. So that the instructor generally has to be aware of the other factors at play with um, with spearfishing. So I mean, that's great, great advice. That's true. And, and you know what? And there are um... – there are instructors here in Southern California that are free diving instructors that also teach uh, spear fishing. I think FII has a spear fishing for free divers course. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I'm, again, I'm not an agent for anybody. I'm just Dan. You know. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, um, that's your, your advice. I mean, that's exactly right. I should have added that. You definitely want to, you know, free diving. Getting those chops down is really good, but also, you know, uh, do it if you can find a free diving instructor that's uh, into spear fishing. Boy, that's a double bonus. Yeah, for sure. Um, the other thing is uh, is for uh, from a new guy that to learn is uh, to know as much about the species. I think I mentioned it before about the bottom scratchers, guys. Know what you're going after. Yeah. Um, I'm no marine biologist, but uh, I can, you know, having spent my life in the water, I can pretty much tell you where to go look for something or what it's going to act like or react, whatever, you know, and uh, and know when where you're going to go dive. Learn something about it, you know. Just don't, you know. When I went up north, northern California for the very first time to go out diving, I can assure you that I was on the internet and charts and. And, and anything I could find out, uh, talking to people, talk to the local guys up there um, to, to go uh, diving, spearfishing and, and ab diving up there. I yeah. wanted to know, you know, and I'm not so proud to think that I'm a know-it-all. And yeah. that's the big thing, you know, check your ego at the door, you know, <laughs> be, be, be receptive to learning stuff, you know. Also, uh, you know, I mean, my God, when um, the best thing you can do probably that I've learned over these years is, you know, uh, you can spend time in a gym. You can go run. I used to run six to ten miles a day. Um, But the best thing you can do is get your butt in the water and go get out in the water and go hunt. That's how you're going to learn. That's the best thing you can do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, cool. Um, with your particular area, how do you learn about species? Have you got a good website or a book for learning about the species and their behavior in your area? Oh my God, there's so many. It's, it, I mean, there's yeah, there's tons of them. Uh, but uh, you just you know, Google. You want to learn about halibut? Google halibut. You know, but that's there's 
Uh, there's a lot of different places, you know, there's been, in books on, on, on fish, there's sport fishing books of, of guy that, in fact, one of the guys that I, uh, uh, produce a fishing show for, he wrote a couple books on, on, uh, fishing. So the, 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 uh, rod and reel guys, uh, they need to know the same thing, you know, mm. so you could pretty much go to any resource. There's so many books on fishing versus spear fishing and you'll, you'll learn the tips there. Yeah, but, yeah. uh, you know, also, I mean, we've got, uh, two, I think three, two, well, two for sure, spearfishing specific shops, one in North County, Merrick, and then John, James and Joseph down in San Diego. You go in there, these guys are happy to talk to you and talk, do whatever. We also have guys that are, have spearfishing charters. There's one here called Guardian Charters, and, uh, there's a couple others, and they'll take out newbies, and it's, you know, uh, they'll, they'll, the wealth of information. Yeah, awesome. wealth of information. It really is. You know, it's uh, there's no reason for you not to be educated before you go in the water about what you're going after. Yeah, cool. All right. Hey, I'll link up some of the local shops and charters in that area that you mentioned, and uh, they'll be in your show notes page. That's um, that's really helpful, Dan. Um, what 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 other sort of any more tips for parting tips for for guys that are just starting out that you haven't mentioned? Um, yeah, I would say, you know what, don't worry about, uh, again, like your, your ego, don't say you've got to go out and buy the absolute best stuff, you know, in the world. Um, you know, do whatever your budget can do. Like I said, when I started out, I had about eight, 18 cents, you know, to go to <laughs> make what I had. Um, and, uh, you know, have some, just go out there and, you know, and, uh, do the best you can with the equipment. Now, I mean, I've got three different masks at least. Yeah. Um, one's a, a Spiro with the plastic lenses, which is kind of cool. Now I've got a, a wife and Jade. I have like five different masks. Same thing with wetsuits and fins and everything else. So, you know, don't worry. Don't get hung up on all that. That comes in time. You know, once you've been in the water, you know, I, I say the same thing to school students. You know, they go out. I once One guy came in a course one time, never been in the water before, and spent $3,000 on all the dive gear, you know, and, and uh, he didn't need to do that. You know, just, just, get something to start out on and then move on from there. Spiro Log, an actual log book for spearfishing. Yes, it's a paper form and perhaps we could go digital in the future. But at the moment, Spiro Log is available right now on Amazon.com to capture your dives and help you replicate past results because if you're capturing that fish in those specific conditions and it doesn't happen every week there's probably some unique variables that are allowing that phenomenon to take place so record them in your dive log you can go back you can have a look at data over time and you can see what works what makes your spots and locations tick get Spiro Log on Amazon.com today Spiro Log by Noob Spiro oh my god Um, let's move on. The funniest thing. What is the funniest thing you've experienced out of the water? <laughs> well, I don't know if it's the funniest or the stupidest thing, but I was diving down in the Sea Cortez near Wymus. Yeah. And with my buddy, we're out in the water and with just basic, uh, I think he had a pole spear and I had a, I don't know, just base spear gun, nothing fancy. Whatever. I used to work for a company that we made bandito guns. So it was probably a bandito gun. Okay. And, um, um, I saw uh, a, a nice Cortez grouper. So I thought, oh, cool. You know, I think it's probably 35, 40 pounds. And those are also very good to eat. So I'm lined up. I'm working with him. I finally get a good shot on him and whacked him. Unfortunately, didn't stone him. So he goes, as they typically do, when it found a big hole to go into. So I dropped several times. It probably, I don't know, 20, 25 feet of water, not that deep. And uh, trying to get the thing out, I got the shaft, and the shaft's sh- sh- shaking all over the place and moving, and I'm trying to get my hand in there to get him out because he's a bit big, and I could get partially in there, and I could feel him. So then I so I got an idea. So I got from my dive buddy, he said, hey, his name was Brad. Hey, Brad, let me borrow your pole spear. So I took the pole spear and shoved it in there. Said, okay, now I got two. <laughs> and so when I, <laughs> when I pulled out the pole spear, out comes a red snapper that I just speared that happened to be minding its own business in the hole. <laughs> and, uh, oh, wow. and so I got, it was kind of like a twofer. I got, I got a nice red snapper and had red took care of that. And I ultimately got the uh, Cortez uh, grouper out. So we had, 
Fred Snapper and Grouper that night. It was kind of probably the funniest thing that happened to me. Just to, just I don't know do- if it's the funniest or the stupidest, but it, just, it, anyway, that's what it was. I love it. <laughs> just a dirty old two for one. That's pretty. Ex- that's excellent. Yeah. I love it. Um, nah, cool. That'd be that'd be that'd be a bloody. I'd be stoked with that. I love getting two for one. So it doesn't happen very often, and an accidental one, and it's a good fish as well, is even better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was good. It worked for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, cool. did you ask me about the the stupidest thing I've done? Was that was that part of it, or because I I do have one of those as well. All right, tell me about <laughs> the stupidest thing you've done. What did you learn from well, it? Well, well, it was at San Clemente Island, and. Uh, I was out looking for halibut in my favorite spot, and uh, right along the, the, the kelp uh, kelp beds, or it was over to one side, a big sandy area, and then uh, reef structure. And I said, "Oh!" And I so I dropped down, and here's a big black sea bass. And I had a Pradonovich gun that we had on the boat, nice Pradonovich gun. And so I thought, "Well, this is cool." And uh, let me preface it by saying the boat owner, Bill Johnston. Um, was always very proud of the fact that in the wheelhouse, on he ran the sand dollar, I ran the bottom scratcher. He had on on the uh, in the wheelhouse on the sand dollar. There's this big round vertebrae with a spear tip right through it, and he stoned a big black sea bass. So I saw this black sea bass, and I thought, all right, I'm going to finally get even with the old man, and I'm going to whack me a big black sea bass. And again, it was legal back then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. I line up on it and I take a shot at it. Unfortunately for me, I hit the gill plate instead of you know where I should have hit. Oh yeah, and the and this is a big powerful gun. Um, actually, like I said, I was actually just looking for halibut and this presented itself. Uh, a little bit of buck fever, I think, set in there, and uh, <laughs> you know, and I uh, and I missed. I mean, I shot it and it, the, the spear just bounced off him. And, and the thing that I remember vividly is his big big eye just kind of. He didn't even flinch, but his eye just kind of shifted and looked at me like, what the hell was that all about? And he just <laughs> slowly, slowly swam away. And I just felt like the dumbest ass on earth at that point. <laughs> so maybe that was probably the stupidest thing I ever did. Yeah. <laughs> no, I can relate to things like that too. I um, shot at a marlin from about... I think it was at least eight or nine meters away. Like the shaft did not even travel five meters, and uh, it was embarrassing to say the least. But um, anyway, uh, we we do these things, Dan. You live and learn. Big buck fever. It's a thing. It's a thing. I'm telling you. Yeah. <laughs> well, in, in retrospect, now that you know they're protected, and, and frankly, they've come back uh, so prolifically around here that it's now not even uncommon to when you're you know at one of the offshore islands, especially, to see them. And uh, they're kind of cool. They're so prehistoric looking and everything. So it's kind of cool. I'm glad. Actually, you know what? When all is said and done, I'm glad I missed. I am. You know? <laughs> yeah. I went out later. I got a, I got a hell of it, so it was okay. Yeah, well, they <laughs> made, that more than made up for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, we've got two parts of the show left. This is kind of a fast around, uh, Dan. Um, what's in your dive bag? Head to toe, what sort of – give us a rundown on your equipment. Well, let's see. Head to toe. My masks are uh, – I've got a – I've got a, a rife, I'll, I'll, you know, low volume, of course. I've got a rife, uh, I've got a JBL with mirror, okay. and then I've got the, the uh, I think it's an Aqualung Spira. Okay. That's my, that's my, you know, and just depending on where I am and which one I grab out of the bag. I, I like the Spira. It's really nice, and it's super low volume, but it's you have to be really careful because of the plastic lenses. I also just got one, I think, uh, God, was it, is it a Technosub or a Cressy? I don't know, it's a brand new one, so supposedly a, uh, the new and improved, this thing won't fog up forever technology. Okay. And I haven't had a chance to take it in the water yet. So once I am cleared from the surgeon to get back in the water, that's going to be the first thing I do. Um, oh, wetsuits, yeah. I, I have uh, several different models and, and brand names and everything. And from you, you name the brand, I've got, probably got one. Um, in the old days, we would call them Nylon 1 or Nylon 2. Or skin in and skin out, and uh, of course, nylon one meant that the uh, nylon part was on the inside, and the and the uh, raw rubber was on the outside. Of course, all my spear fishing suits are all you know, obviously the nylon on the outside, um, and uh, the, the rubber on the inside. So you got to lube up to get the things on. Yeah, Fins yeah. are just basic; uh, they're they're very stiff cressies. I've had Cressy fins. I've got some. My garage looks like a dive museum. I've got some that are so old that they still they're still fine. 
but I bought some new ones. But I just saw the dive at the Dima dive show the other day. Omer has got some damn nice looking new fins, some uh, composite fins and some uh, fiber. They got a bunch of new fins. So that's I think that's going to be on my shopping list. That may be my Christmas gift to me from me. Yeah. Um, nice. And uh, let's see what else. Spear guns. I've got. Uh, let's see. I've got the Pranovich is my favorite one. Uh, I've got the, uh, the the sawed off Magnum. I've got a couple smaller ones, and I've been specking out. Uh, and then there's of course the big Pranovich tuna gun. Uh, but uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna build a new gun. Uh, I've got a wooden. I forget the. I forget what it is. It's I, actually to talk about stupid. Uh, this one was. Uh, Amy Biller, it's a, I think it's a mahogany gun. Yeah. I was walking walking my dog on the beach one morning, and I saw something. You know, when you're walking on the beach and you see something that has straight lines, and you thought, that doesn't look right. Yeah, so yeah. I walked up to it, and here it was, a brand spanking new A.B. Biller, which, you know, they're, you know, whatever, you want to think about those. I'm not real high on them, but whatever. Someone else was because they paid $329 for this gun. I found it on the beach. It was still loaded and still had the price tag on it. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so, but anyway, get back. I'm, I'm going to build a new uh, Rife gun okay. and uh, um, probably a bit of big blue water gun, probably 72 inch, something pretty big. Yeah. So, since, since I now have a boat that I, I can go take out and put all the electronics on it, it's time to uh, next season get out to the kelp patties and, uh, and maybe get myself a smaller uh, of the large bluefin tuna. Yeah, nice. things, you know, <laughs> I'd be okay. I'd be okay between uh, fifty and hundred pounds. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit, maybe a little bit too old and crazy to, uh, you know, to try to do something two hundred something pounds. I think that's, you know, that would have been me several decades ago. I think now I just sort of know my limits and want to get something a little smaller, more manageable. Yeah, it depends what you want as well for for the plate and what you want to bring home to your family. Um, there's a guy, a UK guy. He's dead now. I heard about him on a show a couple of weeks. Wow, a couple of months ago now, and he went over to the Azores and shot a big yellowfin over, over a hundred kilo. And um, I think if you've got the right gear and the right floats, they do the work for you. But um, I can def, I can definitely, I'm definitely hearing where you're coming from. With your equipment bag, you you broke about the three of the three rules that I have for equipment. <laughs> so I was enjoying listening to your story because like. With, with spearfishing masks, I tend to find one that fits and just buy three or four of the same mask. Um, and But lately, I just replaced my mask with another one of the same type. And jeepers, this thing's a fog. It's a fog beast. I have to put the lighter on it, I think, every time I get in the water. <laughs> but, um, yeah, Don't yeah. you hate that? You know, the, the deal is, is because... You know what? I think, okay, well, my favorite one, if you just say, okay, Dan, which one's your favorite one? It's the Spira. That's okay. my favorite mask. Right. And that's the one I probably grab more than anything else. And just for your basic uh, generic, probably a JBL snorkel. Yeah. But um, that's, if you say, okay, that's the only one, that's the one I would take. I could dump the rest of them out of the, out of the dive bag and not worry about it. Okay. Um, I just, you know, but uh, I, I also like to compare having worked in a dive store and worked as a dive manufacturer um, you know, I, I always, I'm always into seeing, okay, what does someone else got or what's this brand or what, you know, trying to different things out. All right, cool. Yeah, no, I know. I love the experimental mindset. I think it's a great way to approach equipment. Um, and with all, with all the different spear guns you've got, I'm sure that they all do the job. It's just a matter of getting in the swimming pool and testing them maybe. Um, and then you're, you're used to the action because that's another problem I have is if I switch between guns, sometimes my accuracy is off. Well, yeah, and, and fortunately for me, I don't have a swimming pool, but I can go across the street and jump in the ocean yeah. and, uh, and test, test things out. Um, as, as, as strange as it sounds, um, that old Swim Master gun is probably the, the, that sawed-off magnum. I probably got more fish with that than any other thing I own. But this Pradonovich that I've got that you've got a picture of uh, prior to when I just rehabbed it with new everything um, – that thing is uh, extremely accurate. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> it's, it's, it's very accurate. You know, his only his only jack could make it. And it's funny the uh, his mechanism in there is, uh, and the shafts are the same as the Swim Master and JBL. So all that stuff was interchangeable. Yeah, perfect. All right, cool. All right, last round of questions, Dan. Fast round, Spiro Q and A. Um, could you just des- could you describe what the spearfishing experience means to you in one sentence? Oh boy, uh, putting myself in nature. 
is probably the best thing. One on one, the more the more I put into going and doing that, the more I get out of it. The more I get in the water, the more time I spend in the water, the more I get out of it. Wow. I really enjoy it. Love it. What's the single best piece of advice you've ever been given? Well, as I said earlier, from Jack Radonovich, a spearfishing pioneer icon, uh, have fun. And, and remember why I, I jump in the water. I don't do it for any other reason. Have fun, you know. And if I get a fish, great. And if I don't, well, well, there's another day. All right, cool. If you could go back in time to when you were just starting and give yourself some advice, what would you say? <laughs> um, well, I'll tell you what. If back in the 60s there was barely scuba organization uh, training agencies <laughs> god i sound like such an old fart um, uh, i wish i wish there were free diving training organizations back then um especially uh I'm, i know that my entire decades of spear fishing would have been far far more productive i don't know if they would have been any more fun but probably more productive also we hyperventilated and and dove down and you know, and you know, shallow water blackout. Well, what's that? You know, stuff like that. So yeah, yeah. anyway, that's what I would. Uh, that's what I would do if I could start all over again. That's why I said it earlier. Yeah. You know, and as you added, you know, take a free diving course and take one from a guy that knows spear fishing. Yeah, Carlos Isles wrote a really good book in your era, um, Last of the Blue Water Hunters, and in that, it's a fantastic book just about spear fishing in general. Great stories, but. He teaches hyperventilation in there as well, but it's just one of these things. Look, I'm not trying to pick on you being an old fart, but during your 50-plus years spearfishing, what is the single biggest lesson you've learned? <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> uh, the best, probably to relax and, and be selective in what I target and shoot, um, as in the black sea bass you know, story about uh, going looking for halibut and whack, trying to shoot a black sea bass. Be selective, and uh, you know if you come up short, don't uh, be disappointed because there's another day. You can go on another day and do it. That's what it's all about. All right, cool. I think we've got two questions to go. Who is the best person to go spearfishing with, and why? For you right now. Right now is my fortunately is my neighbor and dive buddy George. This guy spends about four days a week in the water. Oh wow! Um, and uh, I mean, he really he's in the water a lot. Um, he was going to, in fact, I was talking to him just before we got on the air here, um, and he was going to try to go out, but it was kind of kind of crappy out there today. Uh, and he's also. Um, I'm I'm the, I'm more of a safety guy. Yeah, I'm you know I'm more conservative. Uh, when we take our boat out, you know I'm I'll be the one that runs the boat and let him go, and uh, uh, you know and and he's he's far more proficient. Or he's also 20 years younger than me, uh, <laughs> but he has a very similar background to me. We both have grown up in Southern California for the most part in the water. Most of our you know the number one activity in our lives has been as far as sports has been in the water. Ah, that's awesome. You've got um, such a great mate that's your neighbor. So, um, all right, last question. Um, if you could, I know you've been a lot of different places, but um, if you could choose maybe one more place, where would you really like to go spearfishing? Well, I've been real lucky in, because of the proximity of where I live, is Baja. And I know a lot of your guys are just, you know, they're just jonesing because they want to go to Baja. But it's the Sea Cortez. I've been from, I've been at the top end to the bottom end. And I speared fish all the way, all the top to the bottom. And, uh, and it's just so, so prolific. It's such a great place. There's uh, organized uh, places off La Paz. I think Sea Sniper's got a resort or a camp. So I don't know what they got, the hotel or something down there. Um, sea Cortez, for me. You know, okay. I mean, I lived in, ran boats in Hawaii. And, and uh, you know, we'd go out and, and shoot stuff there. Um, but... Uh, Nowhere near is with as much success as in the uh, Sea of Cortez. So I really that's 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 where I would say if anybody wanted to save up your money and go do something, that's where I'd go. I was going to say it looks like a special place. When New Spiro starts making us millions of dollars, I'll um I'll definitely stop stop <laughs> stop by over there. <laughs> well, you got a place to stay. Yeah. All right, cheers, Dan. I'll take you up on that. I got a boat. You got a place to stay. <laughs> We're uh, we def Turbo and I definitely want to do a US thing. Um, We've got buddies on both coasts now, and uh, and invites from guys like you just um, make me motivate me even more. So we're going to get organised. Um, look, can guys come and find you on social media, Dan? Where are you? Are you on um, Instagram or Facebook or Twitter? 
Well, I'm on, I'm on, you know, once again, being the geezer that I am, I've, uh, Although my niece keeps trying to teach me how to do a selfie, I say, can't seem to figure out that yet. <laughs> uh, I'm on Facebook, All right. and my Facebook page is Buddy Walsh, and there's now there's two of them. But one of my very good buddies, his name is Dan Walsh. We have the exact same name. He's, <laughs> we both are have backgrounds in riding dirt bikes and that whole sort of thing, which is another whole aspect of my life. And so we had mutual friends, so our Facebook pages got so damn confused and commingled then I said, okay, I'll be, I'll change mine. So I changed it to my other dog's name, Buddy. Well, so, so if you go on, look for Buddy Walsh, and you see on the profile, it's a big black dog. That's me. All right. If you go on, on Buddy Walsh and some other goofball, it's not me. Look for the black dog. <laughs> I'll link it up in the show notes. So guys can come and yeah. find you. Dan Walsh. So I got, yeah, I got nothing. Uh, that's it. You know, I don't, uh, I just, I'm just, you know, want to, I want to have fun. I want people to have fun, enjoy themselves. Um, I work in the broadcast television business. It's a whole different thing from all this. And uh, this is my escape. You know, it's a very high pressure, um, produce, 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 you know, and results. And uh, this is, uh, oh, there's produce and get results in, in spear fishing, but it's because I'm doing it for fun. Well, Dan, um, I'm, I know you're a busy man, despite just having your knees replaced. Um, but so it's been um, it's been a real pleasure to get you on the show and, and hear a bit of your story. I mean, I'm, I'm sure we didn't even scratch the top of it. Um, maybe, uh, maybe next time we can we can hook up again and chat a bit more in the future. It would be my pleasure, and uh, I thank you for the opportunity. And uh, uh, I wish you guys the, the, the best with the, the podcast. And uh, uh, open invitation, best thing, come over next <laughs> summer, which is your winter. Um, we'll take the boat out and go wax some mahi mahi uh, off the kelp patties, and uh, who knows what else. Ooh, this sounds good. All right, Dan, I'll um, catch you later. Thanks for, thanks for joining me. All right, sounds good. Thanks a lot. Have a great night. Whew. Couldn't stop, Dan. He had absolute stories for days. And I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Next next uh, fortnight, fortnight's two weeks, by the way, we are back to the US to talk with another old sea salt. And I mean old using the respectful form of the word because we're off to talk with Tom Blanford. He's one of the founding members of the LAPD dive unit. Uh, he's been in the Long Beach Neptune since the early 80s. Uh, he's mentioned in Terry Master's book. Um, he's been witness to a couple of great white incidents and uh, jeepers, he, he, was a, he was an absolute joy to talk to. He's 74 and uh, still diving, still loving his spearing. And uh, the stoke is real when we get to chatting with Tom Blanford. So join me again in a fortnight. Hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Check out um, today's sponsors, spearfishing.com.au. Remember, you can still use that code NoobSpearo to save 20 bucks on every purchase over 200. Great if you're looking for that last bit of Christmas shopping. Otherwise, hey guys, catch you in a fortnight. I hate it when a set of booties just blow out. You know, you're walking along a rocky ledge and they just give up on you one day, tear, or even worse, you you fall over and your foot gets ripped through what was a small hole and is now an irreparable mess. It's time to head down to your local spearfishing retail shop. And here in Australia, that probably means Adreno. Now, spearfishing.com.au are a long, long time sponsor and supporter of the Noob Spirit podcast. So we would encourage you to head down to any of their stores. They are located in Melbourne, Brisbane, Sydney, and now Perth. And they've got a huge range of spearfishing gear. Head in and talk to a great bunch of people who know exactly what they're talking about and should be able to point you in the right direction. If it's something simple like a pair of booties, Boom, two mil Cressies, I love them. But I'm going to try out a whole lot more soon and uh, send up a post on nospiro.com. But check it out, spearfishing.com.au. Head into a local Adreno store. Dan caught up with me quickly after this interview just to clarify something. So here he is again just correcting uh, one part of his interview. You know, I mentioned the big calico bass, the big wide heads and big gold face and all that. Um, but the fact is that now in California, uh, for the past few years, there's been a limit. The minimum size is 14 inches. And just out of uh, etiquette and sustainability, the big ones, like I mentioned, um, we leave those as broodstock. So we something in between the legal and those big babies are the ones that we go for. 
thanks for listening to today's episode. If you are trying to improve your spearfishing, then you're in the right place. This podcast and our spearfishing community has got one of the best places to learn. Come and join us at on the Noob Sparrow community on Facebook, and uh, you'll get access when you sign up to the Noob Sparrow email newsletter. It's called The Floater at noobsparrow.com. Just pump in your email, your email and join our community. You'll get the dive day checklist and 10 tips to become a better Sparrow as well. And uh, as, as always, we, we would love a review wherever you listen to the show. If you put in a genuine review, it helps other people find the show. Tell your mates about it. Jump on their smartphone and even download a couple of episodes and tell them what a bloody podcast is. All right, guys, let's check you next week. Thanks for listening to today's Noob Sparrow podcast. Shrek out. <laughs>